All right, today we want to talk about the rules of the election game and how you can win office in one of the three branches of government. If we think back to Chapter 3 in our conversation on the Constitution, that the framers of the Constitution sought to limit the people's influence in selecting who will represent us at the government level. At the end of this lecture, you will have a short discussion board post asking you to talk about how by differing the modes of selection and the various term limits, uh, the framers are able to achieve these goals. First thing we want to look at are the types of elections. There are two main types of elections in this country, primary and general elections. In a primary election, which we are going through right now, an individual is seeking to win their party's nomination for a chance to compete in the general election where you are looking to win an actual government office. So if we're looking at you know, using our examples uh, right now. On Monday, we had the Democratic primary where Biden, Tulsi, and Bernie were all vying for the Democratic nomination. In November, whoever the nominee is, probably Biden, will compete against Donald Trump to win uh, in the general election to see who is going to win the presidency. Now, in terms of general elections, there are two types of general elections, midterm elections and presidential elections. 2020 is considered a biggie. It's a presidential election. More people are more than likely going to head out for a presidential election than a midterm election where you may just have uh, members of Congress and the Senate up there. It's just due to importance. Now, let's talk about the two different ways in which you can be elected to Congress. Remember, Congress is a bicameral legislature made up of both the House of Representatives and the Senate. Members of the House of, Re of, the House of Representatives serve two-year terms. There are 435 members, and our country is divided up into 435 congressional districts. Uh, remember, the, the basis for these elections is it's a winner-take-all system. So it encourages you to be one of the two major parties. Uh, if you're thinking about you know, these elections and how they may be slanted or in favor of one party or the other, you can think about how these di districts are gerrymandered or drawn to the advantage of one political party or another. Contrast that with the Senate. The Senate is the upper house in our legislature. Senators serve six-year terms. Now, originally in the Constitution, this uh, office was taken out of the hands of the people and it was left up to state legislatures to decide who was going to select a senator. That wasn't until the passage of the 17th Amendment where we see uh, the people having a choice to select their senators. This year, Gary Peters will be running for re-election against Brother Rice alum, um, James, uh, John James. But senators are, again, at large. They represent an entire state. And... Um, the interesting part about this is, unlike the House of Representatives, where all 435 members are up for re-election every two years, in the Senate, every two years, only about a third of the House is up for re-election, so sometimes they're referred to as a continuous body. Looking at it, uh, incumbency is a great thing. Once you win one election and you're running for re-election, you are considered to be the, the incumbent candidate. We've looked at advantages with name recognition, uh, dollars from individual donors, dollars from PACs, um, but you know you're getting an 80 to 90 percent re-election rate. Now, yes, are some of those numbers a little bit skewed for people who may retire? I know we've got a lot of retirees uh, from both Republicans and Democrats coming up in 2020 that kind of skew this. But the incumbency advantage is a real advantage, and some of that is through again name recognition, money, and in the House of Representatives, the ability for districts to be gerrymandered. Right now, in 2020, we are looking at electing a president of the United States. The president of the United States serves a four-year term. Currently, right now, from January till June, we are in the primary season, where all 50 states will either hold a primary or a caucus. Think about Iowa and the challenges they had with their caucus system. But again, those, that's a little more complicated, complex issue, where most states, like Michigan, have a primary, where things can get done a lot quicker. It wasn't until the passage of the 22nd Amendment that limited a presidential term to two terms. Before that, it was customary, set by George Washington. It wasn't until FDR in the 1930s and 1940s won an unprecedented third and fourth term 
where we saw the need for people to come up and say, hey, you know what, this president doesn't need to serve multiple terms. Similar to the, the Senate, our framers were worried about the people being able to directly elect the president. So they created the Electoral College. Today, the Electoral College uh, consists of 538 presidential electors. That number is, is uh, the same number. Every state has the same number as uh, representatives in the House, plus senators. And on election day, in 48 of 50 states, whether you win a state by one vote or you win by 10,000 votes or 100,000 votes or a million votes, you will win all those states' electoral votes. The only difference there is Maine and Nebraska, which use something called a district plan. Our only branch of government that uh, is not directly elected by the people or indirectly elected is our judicial branch. The framers of the Constitution really set some safeguards in there because they knew that they had the most important job, helping to resolve the disputes and telling us what our laws and regulations mean and how they should be applied. So they, did, they created a couple of safeguards. They instituted the, ins the instance of justices will serve life tenures or good behavior. As long as they do what they're supposed to do, they are free from making uh, you know, what may be viewed as controversial or problematic decisions, unlike a, maybe a member of the legislature. There's no popular election. People do not have a direct influence on how that is going to be. Instead, the process goes, a president is responsible for appointing the person that they feel is most responsible, or most likely you know, would be the best, best option, and they must receive the advice and the consent of the Senate, as we saw with the last two, really the last four uh, presidential appointments in both, from both uh, President Obama and President Trump, we see that these can be quite contentious.